Welcome. We are listening to you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to change something. Here. Okay, this works well. Perfect. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's just that you see yourself delayed. It's very, <laughs> very confusing. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry, really sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I, a disclaimer is that I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily a clinician or an expert in autism. I have a lot of people that I work with who are. Um, I'm going to present a little bit of a hodgepodge of some work and directions uh, and a, a little bit of data on uh, autism. Um, but um, overall, my question is about how uh, our neurocognitive processes support the social dynamics of real world social communication. Um, and uh, most of us interact face to face with others on a day to day basis. Um, but we know very little about how the human brain supports uh, everyday social communication, uh, let alone outside of laboratory environments, whether it be in person uh, or virtual like this. And so uh, the irony does not escape me that I cannot see you. You can only see me on a screen. I don't even know how, and we don't directly interact right now. And I talk to you about the importance of face-to-face uh, -face communication. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> there's good, there's tools that we use to study this. And there's a really good reason why we don't know that much, which is that we've used a laboratory model for human cognition over the past decades um, for good reason, uh, control, uh, laboratory control. But we also assume that the same perceptual mechanisms um, apply to the laboratory as they do to real world situations. Um, but we don't very often test this uh, assumption. And so what I've been doing and what has been proposed by others as well is to um, engage in some sort of exploration confirmation dialogue between uh, laboratory neuroscience and real world neuroscience. And um, to make this dialogue possible, I work with partners, artists, scientists, and educators um, and I use a hyperscanning um, with an EEG where we collect uh, data from multiple people simultaneously in a, during social interaction. And uh, my longtime collaborator and I, Matthias Ostrich, um, started this work about a decade ago and uh, we developed software that allowed us to record brain data from multiple people at the same time, and then translate that into um, any kind of audio or visual feedback that you might want. Um, so I just wanted to give you some examples of the work that we've done. Um, it all started with uh, measuring the magic of mutual gaze, which was based on uh, the performance by uh, uh, the artist is present by performance artist Marina Abramovich, who was in the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2010 for 75 days. She sat there silent and uh, people from the audience lined up around the corner to uh, sit with her and engage in silent mutual gaze uh, for, uh, for two minutes to three, uh, eight hours. And what really stirred, uh, was really apparent and striking is the emotional reactions that this stirred in both the performer and in the audience. And at the time, there was very little work around uh, the relationship between eye contact, social uh, connectedness, and brain-to-brain uh, -brain, uh, synchrony or neural responses in real life face-to-face uh, um, uh, situations. And so we restaged the artist is present as a neuroscience experiment at the Garage Museum for Contemporary Culture in Moscow. Um, and here you can see that we did a kind of a theatrical job. One might say we painted the museum an ugly color green, like laboratories are. Uh, we all wore lab coats because all, uh, even though we're not wet lab researchers. Um, and Particip visitors could watch along uh, with the experiment as people engaged in silent mutual gaze uh, for 30 minutes. And then afterward, they went did a microcoding um, following, uh, you know, an internal uh, reflection. 
uh, of what they felt during the, those 30 minutes uh, prior. And then behind them, there were two rotating brains that pulsated at uh, the frequency that was dominant at each, each moment, and then also showed these connecting waves whenever um, our computation of interbrain synchrony met a certain threshold, right? So these people were sitting still, and then behind them, there was the dynam dynamicity of their neural activity. In the compatibility racer, um, synchrony is translated into the motor speed of a card that moves faster as synchrony increases, um, and shows down, slows down as it decreases. So here, uh, synchrony metaphorically fuels the compatibility racer. Oops, sorry. Um, but as you can imagine, it's uh, very easy to get people to participate in these, um, but it's hard to get uh, usable EEG data, right? So motion artifacts really cause uh, a lot of, uh, and override the brain signal. So um, in the mutual wave machine, we instead ask people to uh, sit still again more. I mean, they can engage in some minor nonverbal communication or verbal communication, but we show them what movement does to their EEG. Um, and they sit for 10 minutes as they engage with each other face to face. And then they're, uh, uh, as they are surrounded by light patterns that reflect their synchrony. So more light is more synchrony and less light is less synchrony. And here you can also see that a real time video image in some cases emerges behind the person uh, you're sitting opposite to, kind of alluding to what it means when you're connecting to somebody. Are you really seeing the other person or are you maybe trying mirroring yourself, trying to find, you know, commonalities? Um, so we've done these installations, uh, you know, across a couple of continents. Um, and I'm going to show you today our most comprehensive and most rigorously recorded uh, data, uh, data set from the Benaki Museum in Athens. And here, half the people were told explicitly that um, more light was related to more synchrony. Um, and half of the people were not, visitors were not given uh, this explicit information. Um, and so we hypothesized that, that that knowing that what you're, you know, getting yourself into in this art science experiment experience that that has something to do with your social interaction also motivates you to focus on your social interaction, which might in turn in, uh, increase interbrain synchrony. And we also asked people questions both before and after the uh, their uh, participation about their social closeness, some personality traits and mental states. So we're still dealing with uh, what one might call less than suboptimal recording conditions. Um, so one thing that we had in our favor is that we recorded data from lots and lots of people. Um, and we also used interbrain synchrony measures that are shown to be a little less sensitive or um, uh, prone to artifacts uh, that might cause instantaneous correlations in the signal. So we found, for example, uh, that pairs with lower personal distress uh, showed higher overall synchrony. Um, this was taken from the interpersonal reactivity index. And it's perhaps useful to know a note that not all of the empathy measures always predict synchrony um, in uh, our data or in other people's data. So there's a very, it's unclear um, the, uh, when, uh, when pro-sociality or empathy does and when it does not predict synchrony. And then in terms of mental states and motivation, so that's the neurofeedback, uh, we looked at changes over time and saw, for example, that those pairs who remained more focused, they maintained more focus over time, also showed more synchrony in the second half. So I want to come back to the motivation in a little bit, um, and but first uh, go, dive in a little bit deeper and show you that what we actually see is that it depends on the metric you use, what kinds of correlations you find, and at which frequencies those correlations are reliable. So um, for example, projected power correlations, which is one of the two metrics we used here, um, showed most reliably relationships with um, uh, social closeness and other factors around seven or eight hertz, whereas 
uh, for imaginary coherence, we saw that the correlations with behavior or self-report peaked around 20 hertz. So now you can try to think about a one possible explanation of this, this. Oh, sorry, I forget. The two were also correlated. So those people who showed dyads, who showed more synchrony in projected power correlations at eight hertz also showed more synchrony in, um, as measured by imaginary coherence around 20 hertz. So one possible way in which we might explain this, uh, uh, this relationship is if I come into uh, an interaction and Michael, uh, who was just in my <laughs> Zoom, who was a presenter earlier, um, comes in as well. He's the blue head. So I flow in and out of attentive states, right? Um, and so does he. And when it's, it's kind of uh, intuitive that if we have more moments of overlap in our uh, attentive states, then that will also result in more opportunities for uh, synchrony for uh, in beta phase, which could reflect joint action or maybe even shared representations, right? So the more you have an opportunity to share, the more likely you are going to share. So there are a bunch of different metrics that have been used in the literature, and these, this is not even exhaustive, um, to compute interbrain synchrony. And this kind of data shows that you know um, it matters, uh, and it might actually matter in a good way. You might actually be able to look at different uh, um, psychological processes and disentangle those with uh, different metrics. So we uh, have developed, and this is spearheaded by Guillaume Dumas, who is not only um, a um, major uh, pioneer in the field of hyperscanning. He is also um, a really uh, fantastic researcher in uh, autism. Um, and we developed a, a, a pipeline that um, includes pre-processing, but crucially also allows you to compute different types of intra and interbrain connectivity metrics that you can then you know, choose to maybe have hypotheses about how they relate to uh, your social behavior and the factors that drive synchrony. So what might those factors be? Um, we, uh, and this is again, and this is me, uh, I come into a interaction uh, with Michael, uh, with my different personality traits, my own neural architecture, idiosyncrasies in my, you know, uh, in how my brain is built, my mental state, uh, my different priors. Um, and so does Michael, right? He has his own. Uh, we have not interacted that much. We did a test earlier for our, uh, um, uh, our presentations and spoke maybe a couple of sentences. There is definitely a lot to still be negotiated about me learning about his mental states and priors and personality traits. Now, one very obvious driver of synchrony is exogenous non-social stimuli. So they act as interaction dependence, independent synchronizers. And there is a great and growing body of research to sh showing that there is an interaction between how, for example, our brains process video stimuli and any of these factors. But we don't actually have to be in the same room or interact with each other for these uh, findings to emerge, right? Um, what we're interested in in our work is how social behavior actually interacts with this and how we might then establish a common ground and how social in closeness uh, may be, you know, driving this and enter and uh, be improved uh, um, in accordance to our social behavior. And so we do this by studying a bunch of different contexts. I have uh, some body of work around uh, um, uh, education. And if there's time, I'll show you a, a little video of this. Uh, we showed you in, uh, inter um, installations. I have, uh, we've started to engage in uh, therapeutic interactions, uh, parent-child interactions, and crucially also parent-child interactions um, where um, uh, one of the child, where the children may or may not have uh, an autistic indication. And so this brings us to uh, neural architecture, uh, zoom into neural architecture as one of the possible driving factors of interbrain synchrony, um, which you can summarize as if your brains aren't the same and don't operate in the same way, um, you're probably also not going to be very similar in your neural responses and you might have to come from a further place to do so uh, if uh, during social interaction. And there are some really beautiful work out there showing that these kinds of idiosyncrasies um, with 
within and beyond autistic populations uh, drive social, uh, you know, so social uh, challenges, uh, and the and might also drive interbrain coupling differences. So in our case, uh, what we did is we uh, recorded EEG and videos from adult child in, uh, dyadic interactions for kids who did or did not have an autistic um, uh, diagnosis um, as they interacted with their caregiver or with a clinician, um, and there was either a toy or there wasn't a toy present. So in one study, for example, uh, with uh, a 54 adult child diet, um, uh, diets, um, uh, there, uh, we did the uh, BOSC, the Brief Observation of Social Communication Change. So I want to highlight that I was not the person who conducted this study um, in this kind of design that I just described. And so we saw that there was a main effect where uh, there was more mutual gaze when uh, kids uh, inter interacted face-to-face uh, -face talking than when there was a toy present. That is not that interesting. At least that's not like as surprising. Uh, what was interesting is that there's an interaction where, you know, this uh, increase is stronger if you interact with a caregiver than if they interacted with a clinician. Um, and we um, we did a similar design uh, with parent child uh, interactions, um, but then these are school age children um, and there is also a toy or a face to face interaction and here I need to highlight that it's a very small sample uh, for multiple reasons, including uh, well as many ha have so uh, um, had consequences with the pandemic. Um, I'm going to show you a PLV face locking value findings from these adult child interactions and this collapses across typically developing uh, kids and kids with autism. Um, and we're looking at caregiver clinician uh, interactions, toy talk and toy talk interactions, so your, your two by two design. Um, and it's pretty obvious visually, uh, so here yellow is just more, and I'm showing you all the electrode uh, combinations that uh, there is, especially in the alpha and beta bands, which are the bands that I showed you earlier as well, um, there is an increase in, uh, in synchrony that's very broad, um, and that increase is stronger for caregiver than clinician interactions, kind of like what we saw in the gaze data. And in this uh, in this study, we also see some preliminary, not very strong, but preliminary indication that there might be a relationship here between gaze duration and interbrain synchrony as well. Um, some additional preliminary data uh, coming from work with Northwest Northwestern University shows that there is, in fact, an interaction with uh, 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 as a function of social indication, which is that typically developing children show a stronger increase overall in social engagement than they do um, uh, than autistic kids do. So even if this this data is preliminary, one thing that you can uh, we can derive from this is that studying social challenges uh, in a social uh, context um, is one thing, but it then also matters who you talk to, what you do, and who you are. So I'm sure that this is not news to anybody in this audience, uh, but it's just something that our data additionally highlight. So I wanted to return to our uh, neurofeedback work, uh, where we showed that um, uh, personality, remember in this mutual wave machine data with lots and lots of diets, we showed personality traits and focus. Um, and interestingly, we also saw that those that group of people that was told explicitly that what they were you know, engaged in had to do with their social uh, synchrony, um, they were also the only group that showed this increase in synchrony over time. So in another data set, we uh, included a difference between sham and true feedback, um, but we found no uh, relationship here. Now, a caveat here is um, that we used a metric, uh, which is amplitude correlations, um, that is very plausibly not something, not a synchrony metric that participants or any normal person can ever, you know, get insight into to use for, for future social engagement. Um, um, so what we did um, is we uh, developed hybrid harmony, which is a neurofeedback, um, a, a synchrony neurofeedback application that everybody can access. 
um, and it allows you to uh, collect data from multiple people as so long as it's the devices are compatible with lab streaming layer, which is a data transfer protocol. There's a bunch of stuff that it does and it still needs a lot of work, but one crucial detail that I wanted to highlight is that you're, uh, you are able to include different connectivity metrics. So you can choose, uh, you can test then different ways in which you output the synchrony. Um, and it comes with a hyperscanning neurofeedback game where uh, you get maybe three minutes to try to synchronize your brain waves. Um, and uh, here it's the same deal as what I've showed in the previous installations. You know, there's uh, uh, the, the, it tra gets translated in, uh, into the extent here to which two heads merge in and out of each other. And whenever they overlap, synchrony meets a certain threshold. Uh, it takes it and the score goes up and that allows you to test all these different strategies and compare uh, yourself to people who went before you and after you and we've implemented this uh, across the years in many educational and outreach uh, situations discussions around dance uh, natural history museum world science festival um, uh, schools etc cetera, etc cetera. And so one question that uh, we uh, we can then ask if it's since it's such a it's not perhaps a tool that really gets at the mechanisms of the neural uh, uh, computations behind social uh, that underlie and support social interactions, but at least it's an engagement uh, tool. And uh, you can try out these different types of metrics to see if maybe there is one that uh, some that uh, users and uh, can actually tag on to at some point. Um, so this work was not conducted by myself, as you can imagine. So here's uh, just a subset of all the people that I uh, collaborate with and have collaborated with through the, throughout the years on my uh, work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susan. It was very, very interesting. Um, any questions? Yes? It's probably a stupid question, but... Sorry, I'm, this isn't my field at all, so it's probably a very stupid question, but I was wondering, since you were talking about how um, similarity in neural structures, right, might be one thing that can um, help uh, reach that synchrony, I was wondering, uh, if you're looking at kids with ASD, um, what happens if the uh, clinician or the caregiver also has ASD? Um, like, do you see, is that is this that is that a parameter at all? I mean, it's probably um, kind of completely off. No, the it's wall, a great but. question, uh, and we've always assumed that there's and there is actually work out there showing that uh, if you uh, that um, uh, ASD and ASD diets also show higher synchrony together than um, than if you compare typically an ASD. So I really glossed over that um, because you can like yeah, there's similarity within but, uh, the ASD population obviously, but also a lot of idiosyncrasies there. But I think yeah, I think you're these are these are really important questions uh, around uh, uh, yeah. So there is at least one data set showing exactly what you're saying. Okay. Thank you for that question. Another question? Ah, Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine Barthélemy. I, I will ask you, are there any experiments with uh, drugs? Uh, <laughs> like, um, I know of people who want to, who are planning to do experiments with uh, when you use alcohol. Um, I also know that there are uh, studies um, underway uh, that are in design to study microdosing uh, in therapeutic contexts uh, and synchrony, but I don't think I off the top of my head know of any studies um, that have already been that are that have already shown results around that. What, I'm, I'm curious why the why you think it's interesting. I mean, I, I think it's interesting, but I wonder why you ask this. No, but perhaps some some drugs are facilitators of synchrony, of interpersonal synchrony. Of of what synchrony? Sorry, of, of neurosynchrony within the brain. You mean? 
Right. So the relationship between intra and interbrain synchrony is also very interesting. So we, for example, in some of our educational work, uh, show that um, inter, in, we find interbrain synchrony effects of learning, but not using the same metric, the same frequency, and the same metric for intrabrain synchrony. So it's not the case. So the two, the relationship between the two is not immediately obvious. But I see your. Uh, I, I, it, it's insofar as intrabrain synchrony then facilitates. So somebody like the, the uh, Marina Abramovich, right, who's a performance artist, but not like, you know, she puts herself in what she calls a receptive meditative state. And this is actually something that is immediately, you know, you put a headset on her, she puts herself in that state, you can see alpha just go, you know, people have are able to do this. So there's something there and this is also context within that could possibly explain why people are so mesmerized by her and her connection. So I can see the connections just um, in, in our day, not a one to one, but I think it's a very, very fascinating uh, line of thinking, right? So that you are it, have what the relationship between intra and inter. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay.